Hey, welcome to this week's 5 and 20. This week I'm here with uh, Brad. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. We have a sort of assembled the new studio for our podcast and our 5 and 20s now. So uh, our viewers have to bear with us as we're not quite done. Uh, as I mentioned in our podcast this morning, the... Uh, Furniture is like on back order to like August. So. It's shaping up to be a beautiful space. Uh, you and the design team and the contractor have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Sharon is good at what she does. Um, I just try not. I just try not to step in, step in her toes or get in her way. <laughs> um, all right. So let's let's start. Uh, Let's start down our list for this week. We 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 take some things we see in the news. Uh, we talk about them internally. And we think, hey, that'd be a good five and twenty, and that's how they get here. So, first one uh, we saw was uh, Apple announces a four hundred and thirty million dollar investment in U.S. with twenty thousand new jobs. You know, that's an area that, um, that young people or people who are in technology, you know, want to get into that that workforce. It's a great area to be in right now. You know, the handheld devices are are going to be a very, very popular item going forward. And this is all about the the 5G. You know, it's interesting is it's really close to home. You think Apple, you think California, but actually uh, North Carolina is going to get over 3,000 jobs. I um, saw that. Out and of this. it's estimated that they'll pump somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 billion into the state's economy. Their chief operating officer, Jeff Williams, evidently is from North Carolina. Uh, and it sounds like the it's it's going to be in the Winston Salem area, the Research Triangle area. That's right. Uh, so that's that's neat. I kind of wonder how that benefits Wake Forest as well, uh, right? Because <laughs> yeah. that, that's their home territory, and and there's some bright students that are that are there. So hopefully they're able to secure some good jobs at at Apple um, uh, over there. But uh, you know, Apple already has 2.7 million jobs nationwide in our country. Uh, they're their largest taxpayer in the u.s um so it's it's interesting to see you know especially their stock run their stock has run so well in the last 10 years well the you first think, two trillion dollar company <laughs> how how uh how, when does this come to an end you know when when is the end of the the cycle for them and i feel like the cycle is probably maybe only in the middle uh i think maybe hitting an inflection point you know, yeah. upwards, yeah. another leg up. Right. Um, I, I mean, we've heard, we talked about this in the past, but, you know, cars, uh, Apple mm -hmm. with cars, uh, and there's probably so many other things that they've jumped up. That's probably a lab that I would like to uh, eavesdrop on one day and, and, and <laughs> see what it is that they're, the ideas that they're coming up with and what are they waiting for as far as technology to develop to, to make something work. There's a side note to this, and that is that um, they're planning on building new campuses which are kind of offices or campuses, which means that in the, in t years to come, we're going to be going back to a centralized work location in many instances. Real estate is not dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's very true. I, I, I've always said that people that are uh, staying home with kids are ready for the office again and ready for <laughs> schools to do what the schools are supposed to be doing. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about SpaceX. So my nine-year-old and I had an awesome opportunity to go down to the SpaceX launch uh, last week. That's a great. We wake up at 2.40 in the morning. We go to the launch pad or the, the launch viewing area, which is about 10 miles from uh, the, the, the rocket. So it's a SpaceX with a Falcon 9 rocket with a Dragon capsule. So the Dragon capsule is what carries humans in the space. Uh, these four astronauts, uh, one was from Europe, one was from Japan, and the other two were from the U.S. Ironically, the pilot, I say pilot, they don't actually do much anymore, these uh, astronaut pilots. Uh, but these, th this pilot, uh, her husband, was went up in the first one uh, last year. Wow. So the first SpaceX was her husband. So I guess it's all in the family. I guess. How about those <laughs> dinner, dinner table conversations? <laughs> That's right. So, so we wake up at 2.40. We run 15 minutes down the road. We check in uh, at, at the Kennedy Space Center. And we're sitting in this pavilion area. And they have, uh, they have a big jumbotron up that has the countdown. And, of course, the first thing I noticed was they had this huge clock sitting there on the lawn. And the clock was different from the NASA TV. And I found out later that uh, it's a delayed a minute and a half. But uh, uh, we sit there, and and I, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, you know what? I'll put this on the 
Instagram page for Wiser. So if you're listening to this, you want to see this launch, I'll send you to the, uh, go to, go to our uh, Instagram page, uh, look at uh, Wiser Investor on Instagram and I'll post the rocket launch. But it was the coolest thing. It was pitch dark. And then all of a sudden, the it was like daylight. And the rocket's behind this tree line. You can't quite see it on the pad. It, everything lights up. It starts climbing uh, up through the first layer, thin layer of clouds, keeps going. We see it go into the crowd layer, or the cloud layer, but we don't hear anything. Of course, just the, the light was amazing. Then the uh, they have a NASA uh, commentator live. He's there uh, with our group. And he says, well, the sound will be here in just a minute. And then, oh my gosh, the sound got there. You're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like it was so loud, yet we were 10 miles away. And then you could feel the earth starting to shake uh, even 10 miles away, which is really cool. But I probably the coolest part was that it's 549 in the morning. It was the launch time. It's still dark in Florida, but the cat, the, uh, the rocket is starting north, right? So starting to turn north where the sun would be coming up from that direction. So the sun starts illuminating. We can't see the sun. The sun illuminates the rocket fumes. Oh, I see and, what you're saying. And so all of a sudden there's like uh, the entire rocket fumes are illuminated in the dark sky, but the rocket fumes are bright. And I'll put, I'll put that up on Instagram as well. Uh, the guy, uh, the NASA said he had done a hundred and uh, uh, he had done 116 launches and never seen this before. And he was so excited to be with us there that morning because he knew that today would be a great day to see it. Uh, and then, yeah, so then they went on up and they ended up docking with the space station. Uh, 24 hours later, we now have 11 astronauts from around the world that are on the International Space Station. Uh, and I think uh, uh, today, actually, the 28th, um, the, the two Americans are coming home or three Americans are coming home. So that's, uh, uh, anyway, that, that's pretty cool to experience that. But the whole time I was watching this and watching like the, 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 you look at the, uh, go through the museum there and you look at the technology used in the, uh, Gemini program and the Mercury program, and then the Apollo program, and then the shuttle program. And then you see the, uh, essentially Tesla of the sky <laughs> where these new rockets are, are the rocket ships are, are led panels, uh, touch, everything's touch screen. Uh, pretty much it flies itself. Um, you know, it does cargo, it takes cargo up every, every month, every month there's a satellite launching or cargo drop at the space station and those going up, um, uh, pretty much fly themselves from the ground and think about technology and how far we have come in a very short time span and what's next, right? Right. Uh, and so that, that gets me very excited about the future, uh, especially the future of our country when it comes to uh, bright, bright young kids today coming out of school and what they're gonna be able to develop for us in the future. Right, they utilize and you know, piggyback on that technology that, that they learn when they go into space. They bring that back and we spread it out through societal use. So, yeah, anyway, it, it's uh, uh, there's an article about that, that that popped up on CNBC and I thought, oh, yeah, I was I was there. That's awesome. Uh, it was awesome to experience that. So if you ever have a chance to go to a SpaceX launch or any launch for that matter, uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable to see that. Um, all right. So let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, let's talk about SPAC. So we have a we have a whole um, podcast on this. You can download and understand what a SPAC is. Remember, a SPAC is an acronym for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So what we found out through the journal this last week was um, SPACs. Are, we know that SPACs are, are basically shell companies. They're saying, hey, invest in my company. I have this idea. Uh, we're going to buy another company and we're going to take it public. Uh, and so you're putting money into a shell, an empty shell, right? And what we found out through the general report this week was that the, the founders are getting heavily discounted shares of the SPAC. Correct. Relative to the purchase price on the open market. Correct. Yes. And the other SPAC investors, mm -hmm. for, for that matter. Right. So... What's happening, and, and it seems to be uh, perfectly legal because no one's really saying much about it uh, government-wise, is we have a situation where a couple of SPACs are upside down. They're not making any money. 
Investors are losing, taking significant losses. Yet the founders, because they got in so cheap, right. are making millions of dollars. That's right. Now, SPACs have been around for a number of years, but the, the, the number of them has grown exponentially in the past few years. So they're getting more attention than they used to. This concept has been utilized to take private companies public for you know a good number of years. Um, but it's uh, what's occurring now is that the, the amounts of money that are at stake have grown so large. I think Bill Ackman has created a SPAC worth $5 billion if I'm, you know, yeah, give so or take a billion, yeah. I guess, among friends. So um, with the idea of going out and finding a very large company, buying it, and then through the SPAC being a publicly traded company, just converting the purchased company to the SPAC and then re uh, giving a new symbol and reissuing it on, on the open exchange. And there it is, it's public. Now those founders are buying stock as we are talking about at a very, very, very low price because they put in that initial capital. When an investor buys a SPAC, they're buying it at the open purchase price on the marketplace. But, but if, you, you know, if you're a CEO of a company and you drive that company into the ground, it's worth zero. Why should you be paid bonus money and millions of dollars in stock options and everything else, right? Why should you get that? I, yeah, I think that there's uh, a structural problem and that if you fail and everyone, or the, pro, the program fails and everyone in the SPAC has lost money, but you've made millions of dollars, they were just catalysts for you to make your millions of dollars in the end. So I, I think that it's, it's, we have, you know, there's no free lunch. And I think as investors, we have to always understand the rules of engagement. We have to understand uh, the, you know, the cost involved. Uh, and then are the people who are driving the bus, uh, are they working? Uh, are they co being compensated the best for the group? Well, what I think you're also alluding to is the fact that in a SPAC arrangement, the general investing public don't get a chance to um, do as much due diligence on the acquired company as they would had the acquired company went directly public through a pub initial public offering on an exchange. Right. So there's less due diligence to uncover the very questions that you're you're bringing up. Yeah. So I, it, it's nothing that uh, you and I are going to solve. We don't no. use SPACs with our investors. No. No. But just just remember, if you start diving into that world uh, and you're coming in at the end of the game, that yes, you could make money, you could have a good rate of return, but it's going to be nothing compared to to the founders, uh, and there's a good chance you lose and then they win, and that that's what I struggle with. I think I think everyone should be in the same boat in the end, um, but obviously uh, the market right now is everybody just wants to be in spacs, win or lose. Yes, <laughs> the topic du jour or the investment du jour. So the uh, 2020 census report came out. Very interesting information in this. Did you fill out your census? I did. I don't Absolutely. remember filling out my census. Is that possible? Don't they like come to your house and knock on your door if you don't fill it out? <laughs> I remember them doing that when I was a kid growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little dangerous now during COVID and riots. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I, I just don't remember doing that. I guess I did it. I, I do a lot of things I don't remember doing, I think, because um, we're so busy here. But uh, but yeah, what, what is your takeaway on that? You know, the uh, uh, we are still a mobile society to some extent. The, the, the work at home phenomenon has increased the mobility greatly. Um, when, when we're tied to an office and a location for our work, we tend to live in that area and put deep roots down in that area. If, if we're allowed to, to work from wherever remotely and utilize technology to, to connect with coworkers and, and clients, um, that allows people to move around a little more freely and find an area of the country that they may like better or you know, you know, they find less, exp less expensive to live in. Um, what occurred is that I think there were um, seven states you know, that lost enough population in the last 10 years, that they're actually losing a congressional seat as a result of that. Now, in order to lose a congressional seat, that's significant population loss. So seven states lost populations, California, Illinois, Michigan, 
Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, if I've caught them all. You'll notice there's somewhat of a trend there. They're either... They're snow shovelers. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the northern, you know, Rust Belt, yeah. you know, and out west, you know, very far, California. The states that are gained enough population to gain a new congressional seat. Texas grew in, enough in population that they're going to get two mm-hmm. new congressional seats. Um, Florida, uh, was it North Carolina? Um, I don't have the, the list in front of me exactly, but seven, you know, and they yeah. were all Southern southern states. So people are moving to find a better way of life, less expensive, you know. Um, well, there are 22 million new people in the country versus the last census. Yeah, I think the census show that there's 331 million people in the United States now. And the fastest growing state was Utah, up 18%. So a lot of people are moving to uh, Utah for hmm. some reason. There must be a reason. Yeah. Um, uh, you said earlier uh, the, the biggest number, though, was was uh, uh, Texas. But Texas was 3.9 million gained, where Utah was 3.2 million gained. So fairly Proportionately, close. that's huge. That's a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Numerically, it's about the same. Um, but this has an effect yeah. on more than just you know congressional seats. It has an effect on economies, housing prices, businesses, um, the economy, the local economy in, in those states and the muni- yeah, municipal areas. So it's a it's a major factor. Um, uh, companies make decisions on where they want to set up their their corporate headquarters based upon movements where people right. find desirable to live. There are notable instances where people companies have left. The California area and gone to Texas, for example, for in Austin's become a, a Austin, Texas become mm-hmm. a hotbed and, and technology centered. Um, so people are leaving the high cost states and moving to low cost states. And Georgia didn't even get mentioned anywhere for anything. So we just, but I feel I feel like there's tons of new people moving to Georgia. Yeah, but I wonder if it's somewhat because it's proportionate. Maybe. If everything rises in proportion, nothing true. changes. That's true. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to our last topic: uh, GDP. The Atlanta Fed has created a, a program called GDP Now, and they came out with this in mid-2014. And it's a nowcast, which differs from a forecast on GDP. A nowcast is based upon all the current information they collect throughout a quarter, and boom, at that cutoff point, they make a nowcast. A forecast would take that same information and project it going forward to see what the GDP might be. A nowcast is saying up until now, it's is what it is. And right now it's now casting an 8.2% GDP growth for the first quarter of this year. Wow. 8.2%. It's more than just significant in that it's 8.2%. It's setting the expectation for the rest of the year as we continue to emerge from this pandemic and the economic effects that, that it caused. So at an 8.2%, now cast it's projecting that throughout it's throughout the rest of the year that growth will continue at a very very high rate and we've talked a little bit about that in a in, and i you know and i love anecdotal news as much as i do you know um quantifiable news because it's how people you know exist in a in an environment in an economy you're talking about how we're not able to get you know, furniture for this room Right. Okay. Matthews earlier was talking about how it's going to be delayed getting his new golf clubs. It's the supply chain, right. you know, that's backed up right now. And so what what the, the GDP now is saying it at 8.2 percent you know, with a backed up supply chain. Just think of what it's going to be as the supply chain backfills. And are able to sell right. off the, the, the re, resupply and, and, inventories and, and, and people yeah. are able to engage with the economy in a much greater way. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. I, I I expected a big number. I didn't quite expect an eight percent number. Was that forecasted? Well, that's already? a nowcast. I've know, seen forecasts it, more in the six and a half to yeah, seven and a half percent range. But that's saying that right up until that point. Now things could happen between what well, was it, April twenty sixth and April thirtieth, right. when the final numbers from the first quarter are are in, um, and it does not take into effect the pandemic. 
It simply just ignores the effect yeah. and the future expectation effect of, of the pandemic. So, but nonetheless, this has been a well watched number by you know um, businesses, economists, you know investors for a number of years. Well, there's no doubt that we have enough economic indicators now all pointing to rapid growth. And yes. I think that's great for everybody. I think so, too. Yeah. And, and hopefully uh, we'll get off the government stimulus here with with, with the, you know, uh, the out of work. Um, well, we've uh, talked about this in the past, and, and this stuff, is going so. to be one of the, the sticking points is getting people back into positions being productive again. Right. All right, Brad. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. If you like our 5 and 20s, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions about our content today, uh, leave it in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you.